Hi everyone, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company and thank you so much for tuning into one of our talks today. We are a year round talk series bringing you the best creative voices across film, television and, and theater. And today we're incredibly fortunate to be joined by the wonderful Mis Misha Oshroff, who is currently starring in the movie Freaky. And I wanted to dive in by asking you about your audition for the movie because, you know, it's always such an interesting process anyway, where you never have the full script, you don't have all the details to hand. And you've mentioned that you really kind of just like lent into kind of like the, the fun wackiness and zaniness of this script and I was interested in kind of like how you landed on knowing that that was the right choice to make for the audition. Oof. Uh, so this audition was a journey and a half and I, I had a friend helping me and truly we did a few takes and uh, my friend was just like look this script is wacky I think you need to be wackier. So I had literally a different outfit for every single scene. There was one outfit change in the middle of the scene. I threw something, a light fell and like all of it seemed to work because Chris was saying like I loved it. Like that's exactly what this movie is. It's it's grounded sure but it's wacky. So I I'm making the bold choice in this case as an actor served me. What was the scene from the movie that you ended up auditioning with? There was few, there was three or four. Um, one of them was uh, coming out to my mom. Um, so, or coming out to my mom. Um, and then one of them, I'm actually really sad. It got deleted from the film. And there's this amazing actress, Deja D, who um, we, uh, there's a whole scene in an Uber um, where Josh, my character, Josh, gets into a fight with the Uber driver and it is sassy and it is vicious and it's awesome. And that was actually one of the wackiest scenes because at the end of the scene, I'm practically like climbing over the seat up to get the Uber driver, like drive faster. <laughs> um, but those were the scenes. And there was uh, one other one with, um, with Millie and Nyla, Celeste and um, Catherine's characters. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that works so well about this film is that very specific tone, you know, finding the comedic approach in the right moments, and you all really land on the same pages with your performances, which doesn't always happen and isn't a given and takes a lot of work to get there. And so it's really interested in the way that Chris Landon, the director, kind of helped you all to kind of like bring forth those performances, which were so cohesive together as an ensemble. Well, you know, you hit the nail on the head. It's Chris Landon. Chris knows his style so well. And he's, it's such a specific niche genre that he's found his mastery in. So, but what's funny is that so much of his work happens obviously off camera, but even off set, Chris makes sure we all went out to dinner together and rehearsals were incredibly casual, sitting around drinking coffee together. And for that reason, we were also comfortable with each other as people so that when we were on set, Chris sets up the lighting, the camera movement, the everything our only job is to be with each other. So it was actually really a gift as an actor to be on Chris's set because it's just about being as comfortable and as grounded in these crazy circumstances as possible. So thank you, Chris. Amazing. And, you know, also because you were mentioning the moments in rehearsal that you really had that opportunity just to hang out and get to know each other. But then, you know, you, I was interested in kind of like what that looked like in terms of workshopping scenes and, and character development and what some of the elements that you really uncovered about Josh through that process were. So this this set and the, uh, the actors Vince and Catherine in particular and obviously Chris and our co-writer Michael Kennedy are so collaborative so this process I what I learned pretty quickly that you I was never showing up to set for like a, a a set thing like nothing was ever set in stone especially Vince he's such an improviser that Vince's Vince's mo is to surprise you and he wants that reaction he wants you to not know what is coming next so like so that was, but I honestly learned to treat it as a gift because it meant that we, we were getting really organic performances. Um, so I actually, I mean, you said you cover theater too. I had to let go of my theater training, which is, you know, hit your mark, get in your light, deliver the line pretty much the same every time. And that's not how this went. And this process was so collaborative, right down to writing changes. Like Michael Kennedy, towards the end of shooting, would literally pull me aside and be like, you say this a lot, we're gonna put it in the script, go do it now. I'm like, <laughs> so it was, it was an amazing process because it was so collaborative, despite the big studio nature of it. Mm -hmm. And I'm really interested in the fact that you just mentioned how your process had to really shift and change from, you know, when you're doing theater and was really interested as well in terms of what that looks like when you first get the script and you're working on it, as opposed to like, you know, when you're doing a play like A Clockwork Orange, as opposed to coming into this and the, the type of prep work that you like to do with the script before you walk into those first rehearsals with the rest of your cast. You are hitting so many things that I, I look, I learned so much on this film and I like, I, rem I showed up first day of rehearsal with my most of my lines off book 
and highlighted in different colors. I had tabs, I had a binder and everybody rightfully so looked at me like I was insane. Um, and Chris and Chris and Vince kind of very kindly pushed me towards a much more fluid process. And I'm learning in TV and film, especially film, which is such a director's medium that I need to let go of the rigidity that I, I, was, I was trained in theater. I, I, that's where my roots are. And I, was, I, I grew up doing Shakespeare. Like I did Shakespeare festivals before I even got to New York. And as I spit randomly in that direction. Um, but I, uh, I had to learn to be much more fluid and between Vince's improvisation and Chris's very kind of direct and safe, but very like, um, he creates a safe environment on set for us to work in. And then he also asks a lot of you. He's like, I, I know this is the ninth take. We're going for something in particular. Let's do it. You can do it. So I had to learn to like break apart my theater process and be in the moment with a much more fluid film process. Mm -hmm. It also feels like from your performance that you give and the elements that work so well in terms of your character that you had to make a lot of very bold choices in where you were going to take certain moments and certain scenes. Was that something that very early on Chris really encouraged and did that give you kind of more flexibility in terms of even just the number of takes that you had, knowing that you had that space to try something out and fail and then pivot to something different if it didn't work? First answer, yes. Chris, and Chris is vocal about this, but we're in a ridiculous film. So if you make a mistake, that's good. That means you're taking risks. So um, the, the set was so supportive of that environment. And, you know, Celeste and I come from more of a drama background. So we were really learning together what it's like to be in a horror film and a comedy. So Chris created that safe space. But also uh, Chris is funny because he creates a safe space. He also says, we're gonna do exactly the amount of takes that we need to get the shot that I want. We're not doing a bunch of extra just to make you as the actor feel better. So I learned pretty early that when I say, hey, Chris, I want another take, he's gonna walk over and ask why. What did you know, what are you gonna do different this time? So I had to really, I had to do my homework. I had to come in with those bold choices, like you said, but also ready to listen and something that I, Something that I'm both ashamed and very proud of in this film is the scene where I come, come out to my mom. I, almost all the footage that you see of me is after me, the perfectionist actor, did all of those wonderful takes with the exact line delivery that I wanted to do. And then Chris literally pops his head out of Video Village and says, you're gonna do a hit take. You're gonna do a take where literally throw everything out the window. I'm like, okay, you're not gonna use it. They used it, all of it. Because, because I was not thinking about it anymore and I was really being in the moment. So like, it just goes to show that he's going to do as many takes as he needs to get the performance that he wants. And I, I learned that I have to show up prepared to be shifting each time. Yeah, but one of the things that you do so well in that scene is, you know, that's really the only scene in which we see him with his mom and you manage to kind of like very instantaneously, the moment she walks into the room, we see what their dynamic is, we know what their relationship is together. So it's also really fascinated by, uh, by the way that you kind of crafted that out on screen before shooting that moment. Well, look, I mean, that scene from the get was, it's, it's weird because it's such, it's weirdly a non sequitur in the film and you don't think about it as something that, it's not part of, it's a break in the pace of the film, right? But it's also something that's so central to Josh. I really have to credit it to the writing though, because we shot that all in one day. It's not like we had tons of rehearsal time or anything. The actress playing my mom is incredible. I love her. Um, but it really is this, this matter of, uh, Chris and Michael are queer filmmakers. They're queer filmmakers that know what it is to be a queer high schooler, struggling with identity, wanting to be fabulous, all those sort of things. So. The writing for my mom's character is just as strong as my writing because they're writing from a lived experience. And they, Michael Kennedy was even talking to me about this. Like he wrote the character of Josh to be the queer superhero high schooler that he wanted to see when he was growing up, that he never could be. And that I certainly couldn't be when I was in high school either. Um, so that relationship is really, it came through in the writing and it was so easy to just kind of let Chris and Michael guide us towards a really organic accepting mother and son relationship because that's what they wanted to see on screen. Not the classic coming out story, but a really fun spin on it. Yeah. And similarly, I was interested in the dynamic that you build with Catherine Newton and Celeste O'Connor on screen, because again, that chemistry just reads so well on screen through the performances that you give together. And so was it something where it was useful to create a lot of backstory about their friendship, or it was really just about discovering the dynamic in the moments with the scenes where they're together? 
I would say it's more of the latter. Um, we had great rehearsal time with Chris and Vince and Catherine were always involved in rehearsals for both roles because they were building the roles with each other, right? And we, first day of shooting was me, Vince and Celeste. We didn't shoot with Catherine until later. So already I'm acting with Vince Vaughn who's playing Catherine Newton's character. And that's also new because we've just discovered that it's a whole thing, obviously body swap, but um. It, it really came so much in the moment. Um, Chris had rehearsals with us so that we could, I'm gonna roll it back. It actually happened offset when Chris would take us out to dinner and when we would all talk to each other as human beings about life. And Vince Vaughn is such a curious human. I, I, I'm constantly saying this about him. He asks so many questions. He never stops being curious about the people around him. And I think that's why he's such a good actor because he wants to know about me and my story. Him and I had a real heart to heart moment in the van at 3 a.m. leaving set about my queer journey and what it meant for me to come out to my incredibly conservative family. He wanted to know. So we got to set and I trusted him and I trusted Celeste and I trusted Catherine to try shit because we could. Yeah. And one of the scenes where it really felt like you, you did that to such a degree was kind of that very first scene where he's chasing you where as Millie within the cafeteria at the school and it's so brilliantly done in terms of, of the comedy and I was really interested in kind of how you landed on the specific choices that you made and even just the choreography of that scene is so well meticulously mapped out. And that it is, it is meticulous. Um, <laughs> we, we really rehearse that, that's a dance, you know, it's closer to, and that's where my theater background really served me actually, is, you know, that's, that is hitting your mark and making sure to hit the pads. And most of that is me and Celeste doing our own stunts. Like we had stunt people and they're amazing, but for a, like, that's literally me, you know, five foot what? Monkeying on top of Vince Vaughn, six foot something. And I had to get like a literal running start. Um, so the choreography of that scene was incredibly mapped out, but for that reason, we knew every single mark that we were hitting. So we got to play within that. And Chris's only direction with that one was bigger, more intense, the, the stakes are high. Actually, I got really good advice from an acting coach of mine back in New York before I went to go shoot this movie. He goes, if I can tell you anything, it's this, in horror films, the stakes are always up here and they only get more and more and more. There's not really a low stakes moment. So never forget, I don't care if you're tired. I don't care if it's 3 a.m. I don't care if you've done this fight a million times. The stakes are at 110. So you always have to treat each take like it is at 110. And that's what I did. Yeah. Do you continue to work with an acting coach on each new role that you get throughout your career? I certainly have um, kind of acting gurus, if you will, that I go to, but I'm really actually enjoying doing away with the teacher student mentality. And I work, you know, I move, stroke. I recently moved to LA. And so I've met with a couple of acting coaches here and it's been lovely, but truly like my roommate, for example, my roommate, Michael Lors is a fabulous actor. We met in New York, we moved to LA together. and he keeps me in check when we're doing self tapes, like, or when he's coaching me through an audition or I coach him, the standard is really high because we know each other really well. So that peer nature of being able to collaborate with actors my own age and start to like do again, do away with like teacher, may I please you and more like, Hey, fellow actor, fellow student of this art form. Like, am I doing what I should be doing? So um, that's been a really cool shift as I kind of become an adult actor. Yeah, that's super fantastic. What has that been like moving to LA kind of shortly before the pandemic and having to kind of reimagine your career a little bit anyway because of what's happened over the last few months, but particularly being in a new space at that time as well? Oh, um, I'm again incredibly lucky that my roommate Michael and I, we moved here together, we have each other's back. Um, but it's, it, we had, you know, we moved in January um, and we settled into LA from New York and it's obviously an, it's an incredibly different pace. Um, but we got about a month and a half of great LA. We're meeting people. We're going to, you know, queer social events. And um, it was really amazing. And then the pandemic hit. And I'll be the first to say that I struggled a good amount. I kind of hit the ground running. I, I actually am working on a project now I'm writing and talking about, talking about the shift in my career. I'm really blessed that the project that I'm writing, which comes from my own experience, is gaining traction and we're starting to pitch and I'm learning what it's like to produce and write. And that's been incredible. But I, I, I'm, I'm a mental health advocate for a reason. I struggled and still struggle a lot with mental health. So 
the, the pandemic hit me hard that way. And again, having a support system of my roommate when it comes to my history with depression, anxiety, even eating disorder recovery, my roommate knows me and he knows how to keep me in check. So that kind of family and like quarantine family as we live together and get through this together has been innumerably important to me. Yeah, that's so fantastic. I'm so glad that you have that system around you. And, you know, you were mentioning writing a current project and I wanted to ask you a little bit about one of your previous projects that you wrote every day. That was a short project that was really focusing on not just the journey of having an eating disorder, but what recovery looks like and the fact that it continues to live with you and was was just really fascinated in how you took that project and really used it as a platform to have a wider conversation beyond just the narrative itself. I love the questions that you're asking so darn much. Um, bless you. Look, um, I, I talk about eating disorder recovery so openly for a reason. I, and some eating disorder experts and doctors might differ with me on this, but I don't believe I'm recovered from an eating disorder. I think that's really misleading and potentially harmful terminology. I am actively in recovery. I choose every day, title of my film, to be in recovery. I make that active choice every day so that when I fall down and I have and I will, I can get back up the day after that, knowing that I just recommit to my choice to be in recovery and to stay in recovery. It's active as opposed to something that I'm losing, like a coin that I've lost if I relapse for a day. Um, that film, um, I made it alongside my, uh, my schoolmate from um, college, Angelica Santiago, and we both had very similar lived experiences dealing with eating disorders. And for me, I get really frustrated, especially in mainstream media, when I see things that either glamorize eating disorder behavior or distorted body image, or that oversimplify it. Um, my eating disorder and so many people dealing with body dysmorphia and distorted uh, relationship with food is very messy. It's a very tricky mental health issue. And it's seated in so many things, in shame, in guilt, in you know, self-hate. And I wanted to see something messy like that because the film doesn't have to be perfect. My short film doesn't, doesn't end happy. It ends very kind of open-ended because right afterwards at the New York screening and at the festivals that it screened at, I was there and I had a talk back about mental health. Ask me questions. Let's start a conversation about this really under talked about and really prevalent. That's a word, right? Prevalent? I said that right? <laughs> um, uh, condition, which is uh, distorted relationships with food in your body. So I wanted it to start a conversation and that film empowered me so much to be this person that talks about mental health without apologizing for it. That's what I want from other people. That's what I wanted growing up and didn't have. So that's my goal with creating projects like Every Day is to talk about mental health unapologetically. Mm -hmm. And I really admire the way that you're using both your work and your voice on social media, you know, and the platform that you have in so many different ways, whether it is, you know, sexual identity, whether it is eating disorders and all of these things that are very personal to you. And from the outside, it can feel very easy sometimes to look at that and think that that's an easy choice to be very open and honest with those things. And, you know, just wanted to ask you a little bit about, was there a choice at a certain point as your career was starting to build at which you had to make a decision over whether you were going to be very open about these things in such a public way? Yeah. It didn't happen all at once. In fact, the idea for the first short film every day came when I was still in school and it ruminated for a while before I made it after I got out of school. No, the answer is no, it wasn't, it was never, um, it was never a calculated decision, but the more I do it, the more I realize mental health, especially in the queer community is so under talked about again, but also so misunderstood and even like in my partnership, for example, with the National Eating Disorders Association, I just, I, I just created with a brilliant collaborator of mine, their first pride campaign, not of course to celebrate the queer community. And it's amazing that National Eating Disorders Association, NIDA is uh, starting to really celebrate the queer community. So many of who deal with body image uh, issues, but moreover, it, I wanted to, again, open up a conversation and give people language to talk about things that they haven't been able to before. My recovery has hinged so much upon, so much upon being able to name the thing. I can now say when I have a, a really triggering moment or when my, when my eating issues really rear their ugly head, that's not my voice. 
that's not my voice telling me that I'm not good enough, not thin enough, shouldn't eat that, should do this exercise. That's a different, distorted, shameful sort of thing. I literally call it like my black squiddy octopus that like sits on the back of my head and kind of sucks away at my my everything, my soul. And to take it off of my head and put it away so that I can listen to my own voice, I needed vocabulary for that. So if I if I have any kind of goal with the why I'm speaking up and why I want to talk about mental health so kind of brazenly and every day, like on my social media, is because I want to give people vocabulary. I want a young queer, who, however you identify person, you know, five, six, seven years old to be able to say, mom, dad, today, I don't like what I see in the mirror. I, I want it to be very simple and accessible so that kids grow up with a vocabulary to talk about mental health so that when they're my age and when they're older, it doesn't become this unpacked kind of insidious issue. They've, they've unpacked it already. Now it's just a matter of finding the right words to talk about it. Yeah, I think that's so beautifully powerful. And, you know, you were touching a little bit before about how even with this movie that that character is really an advocate in of itself. And was that something that you felt very early on when you picked up the script and, and was part of the choice in taking on this role? Yes, yes. And also, I mean, look, the way that I'm talking to you right now, there's a lot of very kind of lovely, flowery, mental health positive language. And I, I thrive on that. Like, I think words are really powerful. So is genre. And this film is, it's accessible and it's fun and it's silly and it's wacky. And it also tackles as many serious issues as a lot of the language that I use as well. And that was a real learning curve for me in that a character that's proudly and openly gay, that is in these ridiculous situations that comments on the silliness of why on earth are we killing off our black characters, killing off our queer characters early in these horror films? Why would that happen? that commentary through comedy is just another form of activism. And I think Chris and Michael really nailed it in that way. So I did clock that early on reading the script. Yeah, and you, you know, you were talking a little bit earlier about some of your early acting training and training in theater and training in Shakespeare, you know, prior to even stepping onto screen for the first time. And I, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about what some of the valuable teachings were that some of the teachers that you studied underneath, whether it was in school or acting coaches that you've worked with, that are things that still kind of like sit at the back of your mind when you're stepping onto any set and taking on any new role. So my Shakespeare teacher, Tommy Schreider, in my acting school, uh, really, I actually take a lot of my lessons from him, not just for Shakespeare. Of course, I've worked in Shakespeare. That's lovely. That's amazing. It's classical. It's going to live forever. But I break apart a script for sitcoms, for, you know, for anything in the way that Tommy Schreider taught me to. Because Shakespeare is the highest of stakes. It's the densest of language. And you have to do the most homework to get the real message through in any given scene. So the fact that I can break apart a Shakespeare scene means I can break apart any scene. I don't struggle with script analysis and finding immediately what the point of a scene is anymore because I've done it with the hardest of the hard. And I have Tommy to thank for that because now I, I feel universally equipped to handle whatever script is thrown my way because of him. Mm -hmm. Do you find that particularly on a film like this where so many of the physical elements are so visceral, whether it's the production design, a lot of the props that you're utilizing as an actor, that those are elements that really help you to continue uncovering layers of your character in any way? Yes, <laughs> only because film sets move quick, man. Ugh, dude, I'm, I'm, man, I'm, I'm, I'm the non-binary person getting out of the habit of saying, man, um, I, uh, sets move really quick. You're gonna show up, you're going to rehearse once and you're going to start shooting the thing. So trusting my body, trusting the scream that's coming out of me, trusting the, the French fries that I'm throwing at Vince Vaughn, like it, that is important on set because that's what the camera likes. The camera likes to see an actor who is surprised by their own behavior because it's another acting teacher of mine said that it's, you know, stage is moment to moment. That's an ideally what you see on stage. Camera is thought to thought. So if you can see an actor get surprised by what they're doing and, toss some in tater tots at somebody like that's what you want to see and the, so trusting the physicality of this kind of role was absolutely something that I had to like let myself do as a crazy perfectionist just do the thing Misha. 
And in terms of when you're auditioning as an actor, are there things that you do for yourself to kind of get yourself very centered before you walk into that room? Because it's su such a nerve wracking experience to walk into a space where you don't necessarily have all the details to hand. And like you were saying, even with this role, you had to make a lot of choices and you don't know whether you're making the right ones when you step into that space. Correct. Um, I'm not going to pretend like I have a perfect answer for that. And any actor who does says is they're lying. Um, <laughs> but I've learned besides the very kumbaya answer, like trust yourself. Um, my, my roommate and I work a lot on this. Like it's at the end of the day, you can only draw from yourself, right? I'm not, I can't play an idea of somebody. I can't play what's in my head or what I think it should look like. You just have to be a human. And nine times out of 10, the take that I'm gonna use for a self tape, this, the moment that goes over really well in the audition, I'm even thinking back to some singing auditions like where I've, um, I've choked up and you know, it's an emotional scene and, or an emotional song. And it, that moment of imperfection, when you choke up and the note kind of gets away from you, but you stay in it and it's about the emotion and it's about intent, that's always money. There's never a moment when humanity isn't going to win over everything. So not just trusting myself, but like trusting that if I'm invested and if I'm there to do a thing to a person for a reason, then the, the humanity is gonna show through even if I forget my line, even if the note goes away from me because it's about the humanity of it. Yeah. There's also something really random that I wanted to ask you about in terms of your acting resume, because one of the special skills that you have listed is the character voice of Stitch from Lilo and Stitch. And I was so, so curious about that. <laughs> okay. So Stitch is my arguably favorite, you know, non-princess Disney character. And it was the first movie that I've ever cried in as a child. Um, and I, I got really good as a kid. I was a bored, lonely child. Um, so I got really good at imitating Stitch. I'm very scared that you're about to ask me to do it. No, you don't have to. <laughs> good, okay, I don't know, I'll post, it, I'll post on Instagram. No, but it, hey, it's happened, especially as I was like going around New York auditioning for, you know, off-Broadway theater and very kind of, I come from like a, my school, Montclair State University, is very much a, um, you know, roll around on the floor, kumbaya, sort of like breathe out your emotions. It's a theater school. You dress in black and you move around blocks and you call, you know, it's acting. Um, but I, uh, you, have to, you have to be ready to be wacky. And I've been asked a couple of times that and actually at a certain point, my reps had me take this on my resume because I thought it was too like, I don't know, whatever. But um, I can do a headstand anytime, anywhere. So, and that I've certainly been asked to do, including for the Clockwork Orange audition, so. That seems like of all the roles that that's the perfect one to get asked to do it in though. Correct, and it literally made it into the show, so. Amazing, well, thank you so much for, for taking time to talk about the fantastic movie Freaky, and I look forward to everybody enjoying this film as much as I did. Thank you so much, this was amazing.